So let me just share the screen here. I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen like the cool stuff you do in Powerpoint with like, they have a morph transition thing. That's a newer version. I don't have that, unfortunately, but it doesn't matter. You can still do other cool things, but uh, you know, like people have done like Turing machines in PowerPoint or uh, other things like that. But I, I guess we can just start by like doing like the useful things first. Because like there are other things that are less useful, but still cool. So like if you want to do just like maybe image editing or graphic design for for anything really that's pretty useful. So uh, I guess the example I have for that is the I'm looking for it. It's the poster for, from the Ian Fisher talk that was done in PowerPoint. So here's the poster and it's in PowerPoint. So you've got like the, the, the text boxes and they've got different fill colors. And this one has the text effect on it for the slanted words. I think I knew I forgot what it is actually. Yeah, it's one of these. Uh, but then the cool, th one of the cool things you probably don't know is whenever you put in a picture, uh, PowerPoint can remove the background for it. So this is the original picture. And over here in format, you've got this thing called remove background. And it actually does a really good job of removing the background. Uh, that's actually, I didn't have to change anything. That's what it automatically did. And you can also just like force areas to keep or areas to remove if it like misses some parts, but this is pretty good already. So there we go. Uh, so if you have like something like that, it works better if it's like a green screen, right? So see it like, I clicked the right background and then I kind of cropped it, but we want the rest of it. So we can uncrop this one here. And then we can mark this down here as part of the area to keep. And then in between his hand here, as part of an area to remove. So yeah, it's like, there's no reason this tool needs, is this, there's no reason this tool had to be this good, but it just is. Uh, what else, what else? I mean, these are just text boxes. I like using the square shape effect or text effect, which is the very first one. Uh, all that does is fill, make the text as big as possible inside the text box. So the scaling, uh, so you could have different scaling than just the default like, number here. But then the font size still matters because if this was too big, it would start wrapping. I don't know. Do people have any, is there do people just have a question like that they're just wondering like what PowerPoint can do? I don't know. So how would you go about making um, a game? of some sort, because I know you- Oh, you, gotta, you just want to jump right into it then? I was going to ask about your little boat icons that you made for your board game that one time, if you wanted to start uh, on something easy. Yeah, OK, yeah, that's a good idea, like making some icons. Here, let me, here I'll just close this one. But Mitchell just wants to jump directly into the game, huh? Look, I'm a practical man, OK? <laughs> yeah, let me pull up the RPG thing. Um, board prototype coin pieces. Uh, yeah, it's this one. Coin pieces. So, oh yeah. I didn't mean, I used this like once, but so you, you PowerPoint has shapes, right? Insert and you got a shape, right? Uh, 
let's just put a star, right? Good job. No. Uh, so you might think like, oh, well, these shapes are not very useful or like you can use the, the polygon tool or the freeform shape and kind of like make a shape, right? Um, but like you can see that I modeled or not modeled, but I drew this hat based on this one. And yeah, I did start with the free more shape, but something you might not known might not have known is that you can actually edit the vertex points for every shape in PowerPoint. Uh, and this is incredibly powerful because this means it's a PowerPoint is effectively uh, like a vector drawing program. So like Adobe Illustrator, this is, this is a vector drawing program. And you know, you've got all your vertices here and you can like make them curves or make them straight points. And so just using all the, using that, I was able to make these kind of wonky shapes, uh, just like zooming in, tracing over the hat. Uh, and then just a trick, just a general graphics design tip is never use 100% black. This is in the way. There's chat messages. Um, what, what color is this? Okay, so this is black, but then this is like a light, very dark gray. And that just distinguishes this part of the hat from the back part of the hat. And then I use the shapes again for, for this sword here. Um, this is just a circle, but these are semicircles. And then I just like move the points around. And then there's also, uh, you can also do cool stuff by merging the shapes and subtracting shapes. Uh, I don't think I'd use that here. Uh, maybe I did. But like you can do something like you make a circle and then you like get a square or a rectangle. Give it a funny angle. And it'll be the, yeah, I can get a play around with the order because I always forget, but you select one shape and then the second shape, and then you can union merges them together. You're gonna make subtract. Uh, so now you have this. Or if you select them the other way around, it subtracts the other one. Then it doesn't edit the points here. Yep, and that that's editing points. Uh, we definitely want to play around with that. And let me see if I have other oh game pieces as well as the people. Yeah, so these are even simpler because these are just trapezoids. Um, but I just used an outline and a solid color for them. Um, these are the dash line. Oh, and this format shape is a really powerful box because you get all the options here. And when you have outlines, some people don't know, but you can change the cap type from flat. The default is flat and filter. So you know you get these hard edges, but then there's also a uh, round for both of these. And now you have very round, nice friendly edges. Uh, if you're trying to use like a, a custom shape or not a custom shape, but I, I believe, let me just test it out real quick. I believe this does not work. So by default, it's got sharp edges. And then what if I change this to round? Okay, so it does work on this shape, but for some shapes that doesn't work, so I know the arrow doesn't. I'm just gonna, if you've never used the format painter button, it's really useful because I want this, I want this arrow to be the same as this. So I just format painter it and now it's there. Uh, and then this one, yeah, see it changed it to round, but it's still pointed. And some shapes have this. I don't know why this one doesn't, but it's because they have like this slider here. And I don't know how it's calculating the shape, but 
it's all the, the like whatever these handles do is overriding the roundness, but we can fix that by just editing the points and just like nudging it a tiny amount. And so that gets rid of the handles because now it's a custom shape uh, and it gives it the round, the round edges. But as you can see now, you can't like modify the arrow shape. So you probably just want to wait, do that. And once you're happy with the shape of the arrow and then now you got the round edges on that one. It might have uh, to do with the fact that it's a parametric shape. Because like yeah. you said, we lost the parametricness of the arrow and now it works. Yeah, it's just that this one works. So I don't know, like some of them are, let me see if the, I, maybe it's because it's concave. Uh, see that one works. Uh, where's the star? That one works. Oh wait, that's not parametric shape though. That's some parametric yeah. Okay, yeah, this one did not work. It's probably because I'm guessing it's because it's parametric and concave. Uh, if you don't know concave means it means that there's a uh, it's not a you couldn't like shrink wrap it. I don't have how do I describe it? It's just the curvature, so like if it's like round on the outside, like, oh gosh. It's yeah, just concave like, is when the edge goes inwards, kind of like a cave, and then convex is the other one. Right, exactly. So this is convex, and then this would be concave. Anywho. Yeah, you can play around the, the outline types uh, and you can get some nice shapes. And then I, I've used these icons for my board game prototype. Uh, ultimately, I ended up using Tabletop Simulator, but these were nice icons to have for when I was still using Excel as a good board game board. Uh, and then also my board game has uh, a bunch of cards and I use PowerPoint for those as well. Um, so I just laid out what the card looks like. And here's some more cards. And these are just boxes and text boxes. And inside here I have like the tab, you can put in tabs, tab markers. Uh, and so the four, like these numbers are the same line, but I just press tab over because I have this right tab stopper here. Oh, shortcuts for, for my painter, that's, that's very nice. You probably could have made those cards a table, that way you didn't have to align the tab stop. I don't like tables because they're less uh, flexible. They're very like, you can't like this is a yeah no like this is very difficult to modify or like in a nice way you're very uh restricted in how, like how you edit this so you might it's but I, I prefer just using a text box because it gives me more control of exactly what it looks like um yeah And like these, these coins are literally just a couple circles with a different kind of outline on it. So it's got a one way, it's got this kind of dash and this one has, uh, this one has a compound type. There's all of these. And then I was able to export, oh yeah, exporting stuff from PowerPoint is really cool because all you have to do is select something, right click it, and oh, you gotta right click the whole group. Select something and right click the whole group. And there's this thing called save as picture. Uh, this will give you a PNG with transparency 
of whatever you've selected. Um, so what I, what I was able to do was I was able to save each of these things as a picture. And then I have a folder of like 100 pictures of all of these guys. Um, and then I could put those into another program for a tabletop simulator. Or you can, you know, you could just, if you're like printing this out, you can just print it out too and cut them out. But yeah, uh, another cool thing is that if you want to say, let me just go back to the, uh, let me just make a because this is really neat. So when you have a shape, any old shape, you can make it transparent, right? So the fill can be transparent. When you add a picture, uh, let's take a picture here. You guys, give me a picture. I'm gonna just put a stock image. The pangolin. Oh, yes. It's Mario. Nice. I heard pangolin first. Pippi. Oh, Pippi would have been really good though. Just make a copy image and then paste the image here. All right, so you got this image here, right? You you got your format tools for the image. One of the things that's not on here is transparency. But what you can do is if you have a shape, the fill can be a picture and you can put it from your clipboard and this can have transparency. So if you want a picture with transparency, it needs to be a fill for a shape. And then what if you forget that it needs to be that? Or like, what if you have like a, I don't know, just make a blank slide here. Let's say you have like a, just a bunch of shapes like this. Why does that one seem to okay? And now, what if you want? Uh, let's say, yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a more complicated thing than this, but what's really cool is you can copy this. And so now I've copied it, but the fill in my clipboard will be what I copied. So I didn't have to save it as and then like insert it separately. I, I just copied these shapes and it converted them into a picture. Uh, and then which actually, when you paste something, you can do the exact same thing. So when I paste, the, these are all shapes, but if I paste it again, in these options, you can paste as a picture. And so now this is an image and not, not actual like PowerPoint shapes. And then you need to do like your image artist effects. Oh, the, these artist effects are actually really whack, really interesting because uh, they have extra options sometimes. And like, it's really fascinating like how they uh, apply the artistic effect to these guys. You should just play around with it. Um, So let's get this one. This one is it, like it seems like the majority of these are like a mask of some sort, and they're being like applied to whatever images, and that's what the transparency does. It like changes the strength of the mask. Like this one is really it looks it's like a normal map almost, so we can change the grid size here. But yeah, uh, I mean, we can turn this into like a cartoony, a cartoony pangolin. If we just start tracing it out with the polygon shape.
this scales are going to be tricky actually. You can group items together, and when you group them together, you can scale them uniformly. Oh, gosh, that is just a little. There, there is a bug that I found out where if you zoom in all the way, uh, you can't like edit the points anymore. It's something that, uh, so you can't like, be zoomed in all the way with the user without this a little bit. We can change the fill of the sky to be like a gradient fill, actually. Yeah. What was that, Megan? Every week. There was like a whisping sound effect, and Anthony pointed out that it's like, and the noise canceling makes like a muffled laser gun, and I thought it was you making like wisp sound effects every time you did something. What? I don't know, man. Yeah, every time you click, it goes pew, 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 pew. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Huh, interesting. I don't know what, what would be causing that. Probably Zoom's noise canceler that isn't as good as crisp. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, well, we got our modern art here. So I don't know what else. What else? Yeah, those are like the two biggest things you can like remove the background and, you know, just play or make your custom shapes. This is probably a better example of the powerfulness of the remove background tool because it's all brown here. And I can see it clicked off the little pieces there. You can mark those areas as areas to keep. And it will try its best. Yeah, see that's that's much better now. It's actually, this is actually, like, not gonna lie, but this is actually, like, if you had a PowerPoint about pink ones, this is actually a pretty cool slide now. Some of this, I actually get it in this game. 
Pangolins. Um, yeah, I think I, I can talk about some animation stuff or okay, as far as image editing goes, that's that's the gist of it, really. Just adding your custom shape. You can modify the vertices. Oh, actually, I do want to mention something else. Uh, you can modify text in the vertices of text as well. All I'm going to do is insert text box, uh, add some text. Make it like really big actually. It's too big. So if you try to edit the sh the shape, it's gonna edit the like the text box. But to get her to to like edit the text instead, which you want to have, make sure your text is done because you can't really go back and edit the text afterwards, is you just get any shape. It can be like anything, just make a circle. Select both of these things, so the text box and the shape, merge them together with union, and now you can edit the vertices of the text. And I'm just going to delete these points here. But now that this is a shape and not text, you can do some really fun stuff like inserting a giant rectangle, uh, making it black. That's not black. No outline. This text is white, so you can see it. But I'm going to select these two things. And I'm just going to subtract this shape from this shape. And now I have this, which is like a, like, you know, those modern uh, posters, I guess. I don't know what you call them, but you can like put in stuff behind this, right? And I guess like a Marvel, like the Marvel shapes. What do you call that? Um, I don't know if this has a name, but. You can make it like say fire, and then there's like a fire inside the letters. So some cool stuff you can do with that. What else? What else? Um, word art. Word art is a lot better, but the text effects are cool. Oops. Oh yeah, that's something I don't like about PowerPoint is that when you scroll, it scrolls through all the slides. Um, but you can kind of mitigate this a little bit if you add like stopper shapes at the edges. So like if you put a square and then put it, oops, I'm just zoom out a lot, put it way down here and then put it way up here. So if I zoom in, I can scroll and it doesn't jump to the next slide immediately because I have those helper squares. And it's not until I pass the helper square in this one, it jumps to the next slide. See you, Mitchell. What else? Uh, I guess I can. I guess we can start talking about actually trying to make a game in PowerPoint because now that you know how to make your own shapes, um, there's a couple ways you can make games in PowerPoint. Obviously, you can do uh, like a text adventure. Those are pretty easy because you have, uh, let me just pull up the thing I made a long time ago. So you can, for every shape or text box, you can add an action. And those can just be hyperlinks to other slides or 
they can be triggers for animations. Um, so let me just pull up that project from a long time ago. By the way, what is that card that just says the It just says what? You know, the one that just says the. The. And with nothing after the the. You know, card 46. 46. <laughs> it's the. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. So th this was back when I had like 50 or like whatever number unique ships. Uh, and so I just had fun names for all of them. I never, like, I ended up not using any of these, but you got the name of the ship is ship ID 23, but the actual ID is 35. The what? I like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> whoa. There's a, the flying Dutch person and then like, the flying Dutchman. The why me? The black pearl and then there's like the blacker pearl. Yeah, I just, there's fun names for the ships. Uh, where is this? Where is this file that I'm looking for? Hmm. Oh, I know where it is. All right, so this is a game called Land of Kingdoms. It's not actually, there's not any game to it. It's just, I was just playing around a long time ago. But you know, uh, we'll go to the instructions, and it hand the things down, and you have your instructions here. You're the ruler of your own kingdom, and you make the decisions. Choose wisely to let your kingdom prosper. Just go back. And then the really fancy high quality transitions here, because if you go to credits, it's the same place. It's like, oh. Now it changed the text out. But obviously, I did the whole thing right. So I'm going to give myself credit for that, you know? Uh, and then if you play it, and then we just go into the sky this time. Thing where you you pick the the one you want to be. So you guys want to be princess or prince? Princess. Princess. Yeah. And your father was the king of the West Kingdom. One day he fell ill and died. So you were next to rule. And you're like, okay, but well, that's it. There's no more. I didn't actually get anything else done for this. Uh, but you can see there's two OK buttons, and so that. Will, the one that would appear is based on the one you click on, right? So that would start a new tree of like and slides with the text that you're gonna wanna see either of these two options. And like depending on how many choices you have, it could just get like exponentially more slides, uh, which I guess is for like any sort of choose your own adventure type of thing. Um, but really the thing I just wanna point out here is that like these shapes have Come on, so get out of the way. Uh, insert action. And so this action is, when you click on it, it goes to slide six. And so slide six has a transition with push, and that's what pushes it out from the bottom. And then this color is the same as this color. So it looks like it's the same area, and it just like pans down. And so same thing for this one, but this one's like pushing the other direction. Uh, and then this added action will be, is going to be, yeah. So th these are going to be transitions or animations instead. Oops, I'm going to open the animation thing. Uh, not the animation thing, the animation thing. So when you have an animation, you can make it trigger on, uh, not on click, but down here in the triggers. You can start this effect on click of. And so this can be 
these text boxes in here. And now would be a good time to mention that PowerPoint has a selection pane. And this selection pane is like the Unity's hierarchy. So when you have group lots of objects or things that are grouped together, they'll show up in here as grouped together. So like I can like select these guys and group them together. And so now that this group one. Uh, once you start messing around with like uh, triggers with animations, it'll be very useful if you rename your things here to something more useful within text box three. So I can play like that's it. See how it changed the name of the text box in here to princess. So uh, I'll show another example in a bit, but this is very useful that you can rename objects in your slides so that you don't drive yourself insane. But yeah, those are just hyperlinks. And these are also like, if you've ever played like a Jeopardy game in PowerPoint, they're all just hyperlinks to other slides on the different buttons you press. Uh, so let me just open up the other thing that was a lot more in depth than this. Oh, actually, I actually want to show this first. So this is just, I was playing around with making the Among Us character. Um, these are just PowerPoint shapes. So I just traced the Among Us character in PowerPoint shapes. So it's got like, so this can be an infinite resolution basically because it's vectorized. And then here are just all the shapes for it. Right, and so you get the different colors here too. Uh -huh. If you want like an HD, like a high resolution guy, you can just save this as a picture. Mm. And actually, I'm just gonna mention this too. If you if you want like a higher resolution, uh, advanced. Oh yeah, default resolution. So this is whenever you export things, the default resolution, you want to select the highest one. And I believe 330 is the highest one, uh, but I do remember there was something where you could like go into the registry editor and modify this number to be like a higher than one that is here. But I think 330 is the highest one. But yeah, I don't remember what the default is, but make sure that's like the highest. And so that what that means is like when I save this as a picture, it'll be, I don't know, like a thousand by a thousand pixels. Uh, or like if I if I make it bigger, then this will be like 2000 pixels, right? But if I have it a low resolution, then it's gonna be less pixels. Big chungus among us. <laughs> yeah. Among it's, us. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fun to mess around with these guys. And like you got the, uh, you can like add the animations too, right? So you can like, you know, it, it's fun. Uh, but this is what I want to show here is, so this quote unquote game, uh, it has, it, it's entirely made out of animations. So click to start, that's gonna be me clicking on a trigger that starts like a chain of animations and I click to warp, there's a box around this guy that triggers this animation here. And actually there's no logic set up for this, but uh, when you die, it's because you didn't click the box that shows up in time. And that's a different path of animations. And it'll make more sense once I show the animation pane, but I see like there, you see like there's li a lives counter here. so. Let me just run out of my last slide here. Okay, so now that I've run out of lives, it's actually set game over now and uh, it will transition back to the start and can start over. But that's all just one slide, or actually, it's technically two slides, but all of that was accomplished using animations and tri various triggers.
Um, and I, this would have drove me insane, but because I'm able to rename objects, I can have like a naming scheme for different things. So like SND underscore is the sound and like trigger underscore are triggers. And I have like a short description of what the trigger is for. And, you know, just good naming convention of what the different shapes and boxes do. And so the, if you're trying to program a game in PowerPoint and you're using, so you're solely using animations, uh, there are a lot of things you want to do. Like, I have like a notes thing here where I was just writing down something really whack because that's how it works. Uh, but like, if you want to do an if statement, which is just like the bread and butter of a game, right? So like you want to do two different things depending on what your input is. Your only input here is clicking on the screen and clicking on shapes. So you're gonna, your if statement will be whether or not you click on this or not. And uh, that's a little bit tricky. And so that's why I never like finish this because another thing, another caveat is whenever you copy paste a shape, it does not copy paste the triggers. So you have to, if it's like for every single one of these walls, trigger wall start one. If I want a second wall, I would have to manually add in all these animations again, because uh, I couldn't reassign the trigger to something else. It would, it would copy the animations, but for the same trigger. And if I want to have different things, that's not useful. So like, there are three lives and there's a different trigger for each life because that's how I'm counting. So like, there's three rectangles on the screen, uh, one on top of the other. And so because you click the top one first, that's triggering you lose a life. And then the next one triggers the next life being lost. And then the next one triggers the last life being lost. And then finally, there's a fourth rectangle behind them all, which will trigger uh, the death screen. So, because those are four like four layers, uh, if I copied one of them, I couldn't. Uh, well, here I'm going to show you so I can copy this one here, and it didn't copy any of the animations with it. It's just the trigger, so I have to reassign all these other animations to be on the trigger, uh, and because of that, it would be very time consuming. And yeah, unfortunately, that's why I didn't continue this project, but there are two ways to like handle an if statement basically. So the, the way you handle an if statement is you have a rectangle that's on the screen, but you take it away if something happens, right? So let's say if you click on this rectangle, uh, oh my gosh, okay, so I think this slide is where I... Oh gosh, okay. Um, so I'm just gonna admit it from scratch because it's be easier to explain that way. So we got a rectangle here and if we click it, we want a circle to show up. I'm just gonna think of a star actually. And I really dislike how the default fill is always just says ugly, horrendous blue color, but whatever. Gold star. Okay, so if we click this square, we want this star to appear. But if we don't click this square, we want uh, a different shape to appear. Let's get like that. So our if statement will be, if we click the square, the star appears. If we don't click the square, the circle appears. So what we can do is on our star, I'm gonna rename this rectangle to be just trigger. And on the star, I'm gonna add an animation to appear. Uh, and instead of on click, it's going to be as start effect on click of trigger. And so we can activate this, I know. Yeah, like that. So now if we start the slideshow, oops. I'm gonna go to transitions and turn off on mouse click so we can't, I 
things. So, so now we're stuck on this slide. So if I click anywhere else, it's not going to add the star because it's based on me clicking the square. Uh, and then this one, it's going to be appearing. And I'm going to add a delay of three seconds. And this will just appear automatically. And I'm, I think you can see the caveat at this point is that circle is going to appear no matter what. So what we do is we hide it or we add it, give it another animation. So, uh, and actually this will bring it, this will, this is where things get weird. So like I can, if you give it the disappear, you're like, oh yeah, that's totally gonna work. And then we change this to be uh, on the trigger. So I'm just gonna drag it here. Okay, so it doesn't appear anymore because it's gonna appear for three seconds. But then when I click on the rectangle, it disappears. They're like, oh, that works. But if you click it and then wait three seconds, it's still gonna appear because there's nothing that cancels this up here. So you have to, there's nothing, there's no, as far as I'm aware, there's no way to cancel an animation for playing like this. So you have to use a path to move the thing out of the way. And a path is gonna be effectively the same thing as appearing and disappearing. I'm just gonna make it like a zero so it start and make it look super fast. So when a path, when an object gets a path, it'll be moved out of the way. I'm just gonna move this part here. And I think this works just like that. Yeah, okay, so now it doesn't appear because it's off the screen. And to demonstrate, I'm just gonna make it easier to see just like looking at it like this. So if I don't click anything, it'll appear at the top. And then when I click the square, it moves down. But if I do click it, it moves down and then it appears. Yeah, okay, so using paths and appear and disappear is how you make an if statement for things showing up on the screen. So, and, and we can make the, like we can make this circle, it could also be another trigger, right? So now you can start having trees of logic of different path, uh, different branches of logic of what happens based on whether or not you succeeded in doing something. So if we go back to the scan part, the way I would do this is whenever the circles are coming in closer to your character, uh, you're gonna want to click your character to warp and like pass the circles. Uh, so that instance is where I have a square over the character that triggers the animation for passing this, the rings, but I don't have anything that would skip the death sequence from happening because the death sequence is a default. So in order for me to like continue this project, I would have to make the death sequence something that can be canceled by moving the stuff that triggered that's responsible for it out of the way. And then there's also the sound issue to worry about because the sound stops after on that sequence and that was another issue I had to figure out. But if you don't have sound, then this is all you need. And some notes that I have here are, uh, you can rewind the oh, whole. Uh, and, and rewinding emphasis animations required in order for shape to trigger more than once. Um, I don't remember what that means. Sound was Oh yeah, that, that's, that's, that's just because it has to load. So, mm. a shape that will appear and disappear later, but the trigger must be buffered at the start. So, what that means is, what does that mean? Oh, I remember what that meant. It was because must be buffered at the start. Yeah, so if there is a shape that will appear and disappear on trigger, so I'm gonna add a new shape here. Uh, I'm just gonna copy this. And this one's gonna be uh, trigger two. And what this one's gonna do is I'm gonna add a thing here for disappear. And this one's gonna be on trigger of trigger two. 
So I believe let's see if this does what I want. So I click this one to appear, click this one to disappear. Yeah. So if I want to be buffered at the start, uh, it didn't seem like it seemed like it worked fine, but I remember there was a case where they would just not appear at all. Uh, and so what I had to do was see here that player warp effects one and player warp effects two, they start appeared, but then they immediately disappear. Uh, and I had to do that because they just weren't appearing otherwise. So that's what I meant by buffer at the start, which I'm not sure why it's working here, but I'm sure there's a reason for it. What else do I have in here? Oh yeah, the sound bookmarks. That's that's a really cool thing that you can play around with. So this sound file has bookmarks in here. And the way you add us a bookmark is uh, when you click on a sound file and you go to a location. So like, there's no granularity here. You can't like spell at a specific time just to use your mouse and get it as close as possible. But when you have that in the format or the playback, I guess, you can add a bookmark at that location. So I click here and then add a bookmark. And that puts a bookmark there. Uh, now you're like, oh, well, that's kind of useless. But but animation triggers can be on bookmarks of sound files. So this means you can have things synced to music or animations synced to music because they're bookmarks in here. I mean, it's just really difficult because you can't actually like preview the audio. You have to really guess. What I would suggest is having the same audio file open in like Audacity or something. So you can see the waveform and like get the exact time there. And then once you know the exact time, you can put the, the time in here. Um, Cause it's to the hundredth of a second here. But yeah, so when you add an animation now uh, for like flying or something, and then click on this thing, time triggers, start effect on play of, and these are where your bookmarks are. So, oh, the other caveat here is that the bookmarks get named, but you can't change the name of them, I don't think. So. Uh, and like they're based on the order that you created them. So I can click on this bookmark here. And yeah, I think you just have to memorize what the number is. Don't remember exactly though. And then something that I really wanted to try, which didn't end up working is, because yeah, since you have bookmarks and sound files, it's like, oh, wait, this means that you can have like a sound start. Like, you can use a sound as like a hidden clock in the background and then like trigger different events because of it. Uh, but unfortunately, it doesn't work like that because you can have a sound start at, you can have the sound start at zero and then use an animation uh, when you have bookmarks. This seek option pops up, and this is an animation that lets you start the sound at a specific bookmark. So you can have like, uh, so I was thinking maybe you could use it so that you can have a loop going in the background where the sound plays over and over as a loop and triggers different things. Uh, but unfortunately, it, if you start a sound at the end, it play, it's effectively playing through the whole thing. So even if you have a bunch of bookmarks you want to skip, there's no way to skip a bookmark because it plays it anyway. Uh, even if you like start at, at bookmark three, it'll play one and two instantaneously as it like seeks to the end, which is a really unfortunate caveat for this. But yeah. So I guess now that you're armed with this knowledge, you can use some really cool stuff, I would, I would assume, I would hope. Just, just, just using triggers and animations. And the fact that uh, moving things off the screen is your if statement. So now, now that you know that, I want to see some some cool things. Uh, but that's not that's not all you can do. Like this is this is very limited already. Um, but what you can do is program within PowerPoint. 
So that is called the VBA or Visual Basic for Applications, which is available in most Office applications. So you can do that in Excel or Word. Excel is probably going to be where it's most useful, but you can also do it in PowerPoint, which means you can program in your own game code that's not animations. And so what I've done for that is this year's Global Game Jam, uh, I made a game called, uh, what is it called, the Content Mansion. Let me just pull that up. Yeah, macros. VBA macros, same thing. They are effectively macros because of how I'm using them. Uh, what is it? So this is like the, the game, right? Like it's not like some sort of animations. It's like, oh yeah, you know, like you're juggling the coffee notes, but no, this is like actually a game, you know? Like the real breakthrough moment I had was keyboard inputs. So let me just show this if you haven't seen this before, but you can use your wise keys to move the character and you can turn to and then like your movement vector is based on like what direction you're facing and if there's walls with collision and then like it's like changing the velocity based on like how angled i am on the wall yeah you just it's a walking simulator basically you just walk through this mansion Oh yeah, Anthony, I'm sure there's, you can do some wacky stuff and I'm sure there's a way to work around the caveat, but now that I've figured out that you can program stuff, there's really no reason to do the animation things anymore, unless you really want to, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> So I used the selection pane a lot for this because it's all just one slide. And I can hide the title and I can hide the player. And so the way this is working is the entire scene is moving like this. Uh, and the player object is just rotating and it's always centered in the middle of the screen. That's what this yellow square is for. So that when this rotates, the player is always in the center of the screen. And this light, quote unquote, is just a couple of shapes here with some transparent uh, gradient fills. And then the player is just a bunch of PowerPoint objects as well. So yeah, these are all gradient fills. Like everything in here is a PowerPoint object. But the way this is programmed is you go over to the developer code, the developer tab, and we can view the code. And if you don't have the developer tab, it's because it has to be enabled in the options. Uh, it's my in, I believe. Yeah, you just check the developer here. And this looks like, this is what lets you add in VBA code to your PowerPoint project. So <clears throat> the main thing here for keyboard inputs is this button. Uh, and I tried everything, but there's no way to remove a button or else it stops taking in keyboard inputs. And there's no way to move it either. Uh, but so you just have to deal with the start button being there the whole time. That's OK. But in the, whenever you create a button, it, uh, it gives you this. Or like you can edit the code for the button. So if I click it, command button object. View code. And that gives you the code for that button. And there are functions called uh, underscore key down and key up and click. And the keyboard enabled is the name of the button. So when you click on the button, it calls the start function. And 
yeah, it does false and true. Like to remove the click on state because otherwise you'll be like trapped. Buttons cannot be off screen at all. Like there's no way you can have an off screen button because if the button's off screen, it doesn't take your input. You can't click it. Yeah, I tried a couple, I tried a lot of things and the buttons are just jank. There's no way to have it off the screen. Uh, but the key down and key ups are the the thing that lets you take keyboard inputs. So uh, they send in the, they call this function, which is a public function, and that's in the input module. And these are, so I just insert a module. That's why I have modules. And then I have public booleans here. So these are the different inputs I have. And this is just like programming an input script for Unity, right? So I, I literally just have a bunch of if statements here that if the key code is this, then set this boolean to true. And so like I have that for all of these keys. And then for the input key up, it's the same thing, but it's setting them to false. And I believe, yeah, we set inputs as SD default. Um, and exit and reset, uh, I'll mention that later. There is absolutely nothing you can do about the buttons because the buttons always render on the top of the screen. You can't like send it to the back. You can't move it. It's just always rendered on top of everything. So you can't even like, I guess you could disguise it by like having stuff around it. But yeah, it, there, it's, it's just a, a system thing that you have to you know, worry about. Yeah, you can change what, you can change the text, but you can't like even, uh, yeah, my, I have gripes with the button because the button just sucks. You don't even get like the, the the box over here with like all the properties. You have to modify it in like this weird 1998 box. Uh, yeah, the buttons just suck. What I would do now is put it in the very corner and like make it tiny and just not even have text in there, and just have the title screen say "Click this button to start." But yeah, just like keep it out of there. But that's up to you, I guess. But anyway, enough about the button. Uh, the input module pretty straightforward, I guess. But the where the actual code is happening for the movement is in the player module. And this is where I made my own version of update and fixed update. Um, so update is every frame and fixed update is like every half a second or something like that. I know it's more often than that. It's this fixed update. I put FPS in there. It runs better as a standalone power on project and not as like a as this like a, a modifiable slideshow because you know like you can click save as and uh, when you click save as you can change it to be like a uh, standalone so that's key uh, this one so powerpoint macro it will show and a show is a standalone where you can't or whenever you double click it it just starts the presentation it doesn't let you edit the actual like, which you can still edit the content, but that's not the default, but anyway. Uh, so it runs better as a standalone than in the editor, I guess I would call it. Uh, um, yeah, so the way update works is that as long, this is just something that I discovered from playing around with this, is that as long as you have something on the screen that's updating every single frame, it runs fine. But if you don't have that something on the screen that's updating every frame, PowerPoint will try to batch movements. So like if you've ever had a shape right, and you just like hold the right arrow key to move it, see how it kind of stutters? It's trying, I guess it's trying to batch the movements. But that stuttering will happen to you to the same. That stuttering will happen with your code too, unless you have something on the screen updating every frame. And in my case, that something is the timer. Uh, so in the, at the bottom here, I think, yeah, in update, I have this, which grabs the, whatever object is named countdown, and it changes the text to be the time. And then in countdown is just this. And so like, I didn't know, I already had experience with VBA, 
just from Excel, but like these types of uh, properties calls, I just had a Google. And it's, it's surprising how much Google and like Stack Exchange has about programming in PowerPoint. And like no one's ever made a game, as far as I'm aware, no one's ever made a game in PowerPoint using these macros, uh, like the way I'm doing it here. There is a really cool YouTube channel, um, which I follow the tutorial for. Um, Got to go quick. So this guy. This guy has, uh, he has a lot of tutorials on PowerPoint VBA and like doing some really cool stuff, but like the stuff he does is like actually practical. So um, he like sells his own PowerPoints too and it's pretty neat stuff. But what I was interested in is doing the keyboard inputs, but yeah. Uh, once I had that, the rest of it was just like any old game programming. So like I had the countdown, counting down, and that was also a tutorial from him. But the player movement is just like programming any sort of movement in a game, right? So I had my fixed update, which I in order to have fixed update, I'm using the timer. And timer is just a default uh, property that you can just call. And timer is the time since your system time midnight and it gives you milliseconds. So like if it was midnight, it would be zero. And then any time past midnight, it'll just be the, the, the hour, like whatever time it is, but it gives you millisecond precision because there's another one called a, like clock or something or like time. And time just gives, time gives it to you in seconds precision, uh, which is not what I wanted since I wanted milliseconds here and also because I was using fixed, I was using this, so I needed millisecond precision. Uh, and timer gives you that, which is very handy. Uh, I was a bit worried that I wouldn't be able to get millisecond precision, but it worked out flawlessly. So once I have that, uh, delta time is, <laughs> right before, no, you wouldn't because the time would be like, 23 hours and like uh, actually it it might you might get the timer like this timer might mess up if you're like playing it at like 11 59 and then it turns midnight because then like this math which is subtracting would be not accurate anymore um, yeah that is a, that is interesting but the delta time is literally just the timer minus the current time, and the current time is, uh, what is the current time? I don't know what current time is actually. I think there was a way to uh, definition. Yeah, the, the, the BVA IDE leaves some things to be desired. Like, I wish I could do this stuff in my Visual Studio. But yeah, that's like the, the one thing that sucks about working in, in BVA is this environment is just not great. You don't even get line numbers. You have to like look up here for your line number. It's unfortunate. Uh, I believe current time is just gonna be zero in this case. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just gonna be zero. So, because then it sets it here. So, why did I do it that way? I should have put this before, but whatever. Uh, it works. So, I don't care. Uh, the elapsed time. Uh, so, the next fixed frame is going to be whatever the current time is plus the delta time. So, that'll be this, this many milliseconds. And so, then it does a loop. And the loop is going to be until the next fixed frame time is less than the timer time and the timer is to be a live update. So it's going to keep doing this loop until I reach this. And then after that's done, it'll 
uh, do a fixed update and then add an iter iteration thing. Do events is, uh, that's a built-in thing to pause BBA and let PowerPoint do whatever it needs to do. So like in this case, it would be actually doing the movement of the objects on the screen. So this, this also lets you prevent the window from just locking up because this is an infinite loop otherwise. And so it would lock up the window. So do events lets you not lock it, prevents it from locking up the window. Um, yeah, that this is all there is to the loop basically. Uh, a fixed update is where you know you, you got your fixed update in Unity, so that's where you do all your your movement calculation. So in my case, that's I just get uh, some the the player rotation is literally just uh, this player shape dot rotation. That's literally the same thing as uh, let me just get the, the thing here. That's this number right here. So this rotation in degrees. That number is this number here. And so I'm converting it to radians because I'm using this value again here for the cosine of the sine. And cosine and sine use radians for whatever reason. Um, so I just had to convert it to radians. And there's like no shortcut for pi. So I had to give it a bunch of decimal places, you know, like in Unity, you know, like mathf.pi, right? But I don't have such luxuries here. Um, and yeah, so this movement delta lets me calculate the x direction or the x distance and the y distance based on what direction I'm facing. And so I didn't have to do it that way, but I just did it because uh, it's cool that it's there. So like I get like the better way of doing movement would be just to, like have it fixed x and y because the cam like the camera never rotates so. Um, you're, just, you're just rotating the player, so it's kind of a little bit, it's a little bit disorienting, but it's fine. And then, you know, like all these other, uh, this is where I'm actually getting the inputs. And so if I'm pressing W, then it's going to do this. And so cosine, what is that? Your, your direction. So cosine of, if you're rotating at zero, the cosine is going to be one. So your maximum movement in the up direction will be the maximum. And then if you're rotation is zero and your sine will be zero. So that'll be zero movement in the horizontal direction. So, and then the rest of these inputs are just doing the same thing, but I change out these like signs and like the cosine and sine so that it actually moves in the correct direction. Uh, and then Q and E is just rotating the player, just adding or subtracting the rotate distance. And so for collisions, that's what I spent the longest time on, just figuring out how to do collisions. Because, you know, it's PowerPoint. It doesn't have a built-in physics engine, right? So you got to program in your own physics engine. And actually, now that I've done this uh, this way, it'd be really easy to add in, like, I am doing, like, all I'm doing for the movement is just applying a fixed distance delta based on which direction you're facing. Uh, if I want to add physics, instead of adding a fixed delta position, you know, like, Velocity is equal to acceleration, or no, yeah. Velocity is equal to acceleration times time. So I just do that. So this is x equals x uh, dt. And so instead of doing x equals x dt, I do like v equals a dt. And the acceleration would be a different value here. So you, know, you just use those formulas from physics class. And that's how you do physics, right? Uh, it doesn't get any more complicated than that. You know, you never want to make it more complicated than that. But yeah, that that that's that's like a, a stretch goal, I guess. But uh, the collisions. So I googled how to check overlapping shapes in PowerPoint, and Stack Exchange had someone ask that exact same question, and they got an answer. So literally, I copy pasted their code. And that's like 90% of what collision checking is, is code I copied and pasted from Stack Exchange because some random dude on some random PowerPoint needed a reason to detect overlapping shapes, which I have like no idea what application you're doing a PowerPoint show. Like this is, they're not programming games. They're like doing like a presentation for like board directors or whatever. 
I don't, I can't think of any situation where you'd want to detect overlapping shapes so that you'd ask that in stack exchange. But I, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but that's just what happens. So thank you stack exchange and thank you random person for wanting that for whatever reason. And so now I have this. And if you're familiar with access aligned bounding boxes, uh, this is what that, this is it. This is an access aligned bounding box check. Um, and just, uh, does anyone not know what that is? I think it might be a decent idea to explain it just briefly. Yeah, so let me just hide this layer here and I can show what the walls look like because the walls are just this one object. And I'm just gonna use these colors as an example. So an access aligned bounding box is, well, a bounding box is the box around an entire object that kind of just encapsulates the thing. So if this was a circle, uh, this square that's representing the, like the, the transforms, that's the bounding box. And if I rotate it, see how the bo bounding box rotates? That's a rotating bounding box. An axis aligned bounding box is a bounding box that does not rotate. And it's just always aligned to the axis, which is what the name suggests. Um, why is this line so thin? So if I rotate the shape, the axis aligned bounding box will always be this shape. And if it's a, an oblong shape, uh, then when I rotate this, the axis aligned bounding box will change size. Uh, be, because it'll always be aligned. And so if it's like this, then the axis aligned bounding box will change its shape to be like this. That's what an axis aligned bounding box is. And all that, like in code, the way that's defined uh, is I'm not, I'm just getting the extents of the shape. So the leftmost point on the shape is going to be the left coordinate. Uh, oh, yeah. So in PowerPoint, the origin of the shape is defined as the top left. So you have these dot left and dot top. Those are just the parameters of the shape because that's what in here, this uh, position. Yes. Oh, you can actually change the origin, but it, it, the default is the top left corner. So this position is would be here. I would know. Uh, hmm, actually, that's a good question. I believe this is a bounding box. Let me wait, I'm gonna test this out actually really quick, zero. zero. I need to know. Interesting. Huh. Hmm. Okay, well, I guess I don't know. Anyway, I guess it doesn't matter too much, but so the dot left is getting that leftmost point. So then the rightmost point is just gonna be whatever that dot left, is, dot left is plus the width of the shape. And the width of the shape is uh, like the bounding box size. So I guess if I rotate this, huh, yeah, that is weird. Hmm, maybe this. Oh, okay, yeah, I remember, I remember this now. So that's the, okay, yeah. So that's the reason why the world does not rotate is because these values here are not a axis line bounding box. And they're like, if I rotate the shape, right? This width doesn't change based on how I rotate it. And the top left corner, I don't, I believe this also doesn't change. Let me just put zero and if I rotate it. Yeah, so this doesn't change. So, but if I rotate it, okay, yeah. So now what, so I put it as zero rotation. Okay, so these numbers here for the position are in fact based on a zero rotation. So I guess it is applying the rotation after the position, which makes sense. Um, so that's the reason I don't rotate the world is because if I did rotate the world, then the width and height would no longer be accurate for an axis aligned bounding box. Uh, and the calculation would get a little bit more complicated. But if I, as long as I don't rotate 
the world, then using the width and height will be accurate for a square or a rectangle. So dot left is dot left, dot right is gonna be the left plus the width, the top is gonna be the top, and then the bottom is gonna be the top plus the height. Right, does that make, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and so I do that for two shapes and the two shapes I'm checking here are one wall and the player, the player collision box. And then it, checking overlaps is just comparing the coordinates, right? So like if the coordinate is, uh, so like let's say this is the player and I'm on the right of the box. So my right coordinate is gonna be greater than the right coordinate of the bounding box. So I'm gonna be outside of the bounding box. But if my right coordinate is less than the right coordinate of the box, then I'm inside the box only if I'm also below the top coordinate and above the bottom coordinate, right? So that's just what all these if statements are doing. It's, it's just checking whether or not I'm like within the bounds in here. And if I am, then I am overlapping and it just returns the booleans for that. Uh, and then in the player script, whenever I'm checking the walls, then I'm using, I'm doing, I can get, uh, I can know which side of, I can know if I'm hitting the wall on top or the wall on the bottom or the wall on the left or the wall on the right. And I can prevent you from moving in that direction by just setting uh, the delta movement in like the x or y to zero. And that's what these if statements are doing. It's like, I'm only calling the upwards movement if I'm moving upwards, because if I'm not moving upwards, then I can still move downwards. And actually I was trying, I spent a lot of time because I was trying to be fancy and like calculate your incident velocity or whatever, or like, uh, I was trying to use one collision box for the player and then like figure out if I'm hitting a wall on my left or my right or the top or the bottom. But that math was getting too complicated for me and it was a game jam. So instead what I did was I just have four, nope, not that. I just have four boxes around the player and they're just invisible there. But these four boxes in here, let me know if I'm hitting a wall. So like if something's overlapping with the top, then I know there's a wall on top of me. If something's overlapping to the left, then I know there's a wall to my left. If something's overlapping the bottom, then I know something's there's a wall to the bottom. And so I just have one box for each side. And that's let, lets me know which like which direction to stop the movement, right? And that's just like that's it's not optimized at all. And you know. If you optimize it, you can probably get it to run a lot faster because every single physics frame, which is every 0 0.15, 0 0.015 seconds, it's checking every single wall, which each of these, each of these squares here. So it's just doing a loop through every single one of these walls. Uh, and there's like what 20 or something? There's like 30. So if you have a lot more walls, it would be it would run a lot slower. Um, yeah, that's like the one thing. For VBA is like and programming a game in PowerPoint is you really kind of watch your optimization for things like that. But yeah, those are I think that's, that's pretty much everything because you know you have your movement script, but like and then you have your collision script. The rest of it's just uh, there's not really a game loop other than reaching the end and it just gives you a pop up message. Uh, but one of the oh yeah one of the things I discovered from just like working on this is when you move something with a macro in PowerPoint, it actually moves the object in the slide permanently. So like when you exit the slideshow, the object has still moved. So that was like one of the things I had to fix during the work on this is, as soon as you start the slideshow, it saves the position of all these walls into like a variable. And then as soon as you're done with the presentation, it reloads those positions from when you started, so it resets the position. Because uh, otherwise, the game would start with the whatever rotation and position you'd left off at, um, which is kind of annoying because then you have to like go back and like manually set them on a zero or whatever. 
but yeah, that's what that's the last that's the last piece of the puzzle is the reset player that's just moving all the shades back to their original starting position. But other than that, that's the entire game basically. Uh, the movement and the collisions were like the two biggest things. And you know, it's a game jam, so I was running out of time at this point, and like I needed like something else, just like fill in the gaps. Uh, so I just add some text boxes with some funny words. But like, I guess like all these guys are uh, shapes. Oh, and something I did for optimization purposes is these are like all these paths here, they're all just one shape because in the movement script, uh, what I do is for every, yeah, world shape, world shape is a group and moving a group of a lot of objects is slow but if there's only like one or two objects then it's a lot faster so i had to like i just basically have the, the lower number of shapes the better uh so that was just me like lowering the number of shapes it's just combining all the shapes of the same color uh just to get to run a little bit better and so I think those are merged and i think these are merged too yeah so like these are all the same color so they're all merged um, but like i have a different slideshow where i have uh, the characters and the world as individual objects where I was like editing stuff. It's like this where I was playing around with different types of walls and things. But yeah. Uh, what else? I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure that's everything. I don't know if you guys recognize this art, but it's a, uh, a texture fill and it's using this texture because so I don't know why these are here. I don't think anyone's ever used these. So who's ready to make a, a game in PowerPoint now? Might have to give it a shot. It's pain. Don't do it. <laughs> I had, I mean, you can do it, but I already had the, I guess like I already had an advantage from knowing VBA already. Mm -hmm. uh, if you already know VBA, then go for it, I guess. But the learning, the learning curve is kind of whack. The working in this like editor is just not great. Mm -hmm. Google, Google is your friend. Like I had a Google, like I Googled a lot of stuff. I had like 50 million tabs open and like, the Microsoft documentation for BBA is actually really nice. Hmm. Like I, I had all the shape properties pulled up and I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> you can you can even add shapes. So like my original concept for like a game is like an asteroids clone. Uh, but I this was a lot easier. Um, because I didn't have to program in like a projectile. I was like, you know what? I don't feel like programming a projectile, so I'm just gonna have something that doesn't use that. But yeah, so like you can add a shape and like change its properties and all of that with Mac with like this code and it's pretty powerful stuff for PowerPoint. <laughs> I don't know, does anyone have like any additional questions? It's a very great program. No questions. Thoughts, feedback? comments, questions, concerns. It was, yeah, it is a lot. Literally just play PowerPoint, play with PowerPoint. Like the only reason I I guess like, so like in high school, I didn't, I didn't have a laptop until uh, like mid junior year. So like freshman and sophomore year, all I had was a, a Microsoft Surface 2. And if you don't remember, the Microsoft Surface 2, not the Surface 2 Pro, but the regular one, uh, that was back when 
the Surface still had Windows 8 RT, which was an, it would ARM based Windows. Uh, it wasn't until the Surface Pro that they had like an actual processor in there, but so the RT version of Windows was basically a useless version of Windows, but the only thing it had was, the only thing useful it had was Microsoft Office. It's so like you couldn't run programs, but you could play around with Office. And so that's why I just like know a lot of stuff about PowerPoint is because I spent a lot of time just doing that. And I need to go back and check if the Surface had VBA. Uh, if it did, I'm gonna be very upset because otherwise I've been learning that a lot too, too but whatever. But yeah, that, what is MITA? Oh, at the high school, Michaela and I went to, it was like Microsoft IT Academy, like your Microsoft Office class. Oh, yeah, I don't know. VBA is just really useful to learn, even for like Excel and like mass spreadsheet work. Uh, even like a, just a short VBA script will be very, very handy. I mean, like. They should, they should, they should have you do this for the certification. <laughs> PowerPoint expert certification. What was it? I think the the only difference between the standard and the expert certification was literally like making a highlight macro in Word when I took that test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Very cool.